morning. If you got your Bibles, we're going to, well, we're going to jump around a little bit, but we're going to spend some time in Mark 8, Mark 9, and Mark 10. Picking up where we left off, um, we we're talking about the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, what um, his time on earth was like, the lessons that he taught. We've talked a lot about what Jesus did, who he was, and how he lived his life, and how he drew people to him. I'll be honest with you, we come now to a point where there's a change in Mark's gospel. There are 16 chapters, and in chapters 8, 9, 10, there's a, there's a distinct change in his focus. Three times in those chapters, once in Mark 8, once in 9, and maybe twice in Mark chapter 10, Jesus starts to talk about his purpose. And so, you know, on the front end too, let me tell you, there will be scriptures on these screens today. And I don't expect for us to have time to turn to every one of them. If you're a note taker, probably the best thing to do would be to start with the verses and then worry about what it says so that you can look those up later because we're going to breeze through some of these. But what you're going to find in Mark 8, 31 and 32, and Mark 9, 30 and 31, and as we've seen in Mark 10, is that Jesus is speaking about his death. Now, he's been this, this person, and they're a little bit unsure of who he is. And we've been talking about man, myth, legend, more. Well, they're trying to figure that out. What they know is that Jesus can heal people. My blind relatives can see now. My deaf relatives can hear now. People that couldn't talk, they can speak now. The lame are able to get up and walk and carry their bed around these days. And so that's new. That's different. So there is something new and different about Jesus. They've heard his messages. They've heard that, that he speaks life. They've heard messages like the Sermon on the Mount by now where he talks to them about, you've heard it said, this way, but I'm telling you, there's something different. Let's get down to the heart of what really matters is what Jesus wants them to do. And so they've seen the miracles. They've witnessed the teachings. They've heard all these great lessons. They've seen how Jesus responds to people. And they've seen a lot of people get upset at Jesus. They've seen a lot of people who are really unhappy with the message of life that he brings them. We talked a few weeks ago about how all he did was help people and heal people and feed people and try to do his best to care for and love people around him. And people want to arrest him and want to throw him out and they want to get rid of him and eventually they want to kill him. And so in Mark 8, 9, and 10, Jesus says, okay, here's the purpose. I came to live, but I'm going to die at the hands of the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees in Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer all these different things, but it's okay because on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Three times he tells them that. Most distinctly, in Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, The Son of Man did not come to be served. The Son of Man came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, there are tons of ideas packed into that one statement, to give my life as a ransom for many. All right? He's talking about there's got to be an exchange. There's got to be a substitute sacrifice here. The idea of a ransom is pretty interesting to me. There's a payment here. Someone held a price over our heads, and Jesus says, my death comes to pay the price that sin uh, destroys, that sin engages, in, sin engages in the world. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus is going to pay that price. But the more you look at the crucifixion, the more puzzling it becomes. Because surely the death of Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the, surely the death of Jesus is more than just a financial transaction. Surely it's more than just a legal standing issue between me and God and between you and God. Surely it's more than just, okay, you keep sinning, you keep messing up, and so I'm going to come give my life to pay for all your mistakes. It's got to be more than that. And I, I believe that it is, and I want to show you today that it's more than just I'm coming to, to, I guess, be sorry for you because you keep messing up and you can't get your lives right. That's not what he's saying at all. It's much deeper. And to really dive into this, you've got to see the world in which Jesus enters into. I want you to see the life that he lives, and not just his message, not just the words about him coming to give my life. I want you to see kind of what he steps into in his mind when he steps into the world. These verses on the bottom of the screen here are distinctly verses that tell us about who has some degree of power in this world. In Luke chapter 4, one of the, the accounts of the temptations of Jesus Satan brings him up and he shows him all the, the kingdoms of the world and he says, I will give you these kingdoms if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus never says, no you won't because you can't do that. He seems to understand that Satan does have some kind of sway 
over the powers and the kingdoms of the world. That's what John says in 1 John 5, verse 19, that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Paul writes basically the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In Ephesians 2, Paul writes that there's this prince of the power of the air. He calls Satan a prince of the power of the air. And that's interesting to me because Jesus steps into this world and he says, yes, my, my mission, my purpose is to come and not to be served, but to serve you by giving my life as a ransom payment for many. But it's more than just a financial transaction. It's more than just trying to get my legal standing with God right. He enters a world where there's a fight going on. A few years ago, I preached a series of sermons called Angels and Demons. And I talked a lot about the fight, the, the spiritual battle that goes on maybe behind the scenes that we don't, we don't see a lot of. But distinctly, an act of warfare in that fight is Jesus coming into this world and waging war against the powers that be. Jesus came for a fight, came to destroy Satan. And I want us to see some of the verses um, in Scripture that really pull this out of the text and really uh, pinpoint, I guess, what Jesus came to do. The first one begins all the way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, where Jesus is maybe hinted at early on where um, after the fall, you know, Adam and Eve take the fruit, they eat the fruit, and then there's this curse that's placed, and there's this problem that everybody's going to have with the struggle with creation and between creation. And so God gives this prophecy in Genesis 3.15, and he says, yes, the serpent, the evil behind this serpent, it is going to bruise his heel, but my man is going to crush the head of the serpent. The theme that runs throughout Scripture, it's a theme that happens over and over and over again. It shows up in Acts 10 in the preaching of the apostles about how God is going to overcome this Satan with his son, Jesus. Psalm 110, verse 1, is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. And it's the verse that tells us that he will make his enemies his footstool. That's an act of warfare. The most quoted verse in the New Testament from the Old Testament is an act of warfare verse where he says, my chosen one, my son, the Christ is going to come and he will not rest until the enemies are his footstool, until he's overcome them, until he's beaten them down. And when you ask Jesus, you talk about what Jesus came for, what, what he came to do, you're going to see a lot of images that are warfare images in nature going to see a lot of times where Jesus says, I came for a fight, and this fight that I came is against Satan. Like in John 12, start looking at, at how Jesus describes his fight. Well, in John 12, 31, it's to drive out the ruler of the world. And we're sitting back saying, hold on a second, you're talking about ruler of the world stuff here. I thought God ruled the world. Well, sure. I thought Jesus is Lord of the universe. Well, you got that right too. But if you're asking Jesus, so what are you doing here? What, what's the purpose here? Yeah, I know you want to give your life as a ransom for many. That is the purpose. But he's going to do that by driving out, in his own words, the ruler of the world. John says something similar in 1 John chapter 3. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, uh, verse 8. He says, I came to destroy the works of Satan. Well, that's, that's a big picture idea. Satan does a lot of different things in Scripture. And Jesus says, I came to destroy those works. In Hebrews chapter 2, he gives us a little bit more insight about what particularly maybe those works are. Hebrews 2 verses 14 and 15, he says, I came to, to destroy this fear of death. And if you heard the announcements, or if you read in your news sheet today or this last week, you know that this is a congregation that over the last seven days has dealt with a lot of death. We don't want to Deal with the happy times, the times that make us smile and laugh. But Jesus says, you know, there's something dark about life sometimes. And it drives us away sometimes. It splits us sometimes. It makes us upset. It steals our joy. But he says in Hebrews 2, I came to destroy this fear of death that Satan holds over God's creation. That's a big picture idea that Jesus came to drive out. In Luke chapter 11, Verses 21 and 22, he talks about Satan in terms of a strong man. And he says, I came to plunder his house, to, to take back what is rightfully God's. And to do that, I've got to bind the strong man so I can take 
what doesn't even belong to him. I can take back God's creation from him. In Colossians 2, it's to disarm the rulers and the powers and the authorities. That's spiritual language. And Paul is saying, this is what Jesus did. He came to disarm rulers and powers who were taking us away from God's will. And in Luke 4, when Jesus comes on the scene for the first time, he says, okay, I came so that the captives bound by Satan can be set free. Sometimes when he heals people, he'll say, this person has been bound by Satan for so many years, and I came to set them free. You get the idea. Jesus comes to bring life. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy in John 10. But Jesus comes to bring life in spite of that. In 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter, he again quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, where in the resurrection, God finally wins this battle and his enemies become his footstool. See, the early Christians, they looked at life and they didn't see it maybe as black and white as you and I do in our Western 21st century world. They saw maybe behind the scenes, there are a lot of powers and forces, evil things that play into the world. And sometimes we try to explain why bad things happen. And we say, well, there's this logical progression of, of how this all worked out. And they would say, well, the Satan's behind that. It's the powers, it's the authorities that work behind the scenes. They understood that there's a fight against those things. Jesus comes into a world just like that, and he sees his primary purpose, yes, to give his life as a ransom for many. How's he going to do it, though? He's going to bind the strong man. He's going to overcome the one that they perceive to rule the world. He's going to drive him out. He's going to overcome Satan's works. He's going to overcome the fear of death. He's overcoming death so I want you to see Jesus coming into this world as an act of warfare. Not just to come and, and share nice messages and preach good sermons and to heal people who are sick or afflicted. Not just to upset the powers that be. He did all that, but every one of those should be seen as an act of warfare. Ultimately, you come to places like Colossians chapter 1. And I want to invite you to turn over to Colossians 1, and then we're going to look at Colossians 2 very briefly this morning. But this whole idea of warfare finally becomes centered on the cross. So you'll read a couple of passages here. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 15, where Paul writes that he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation, were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, or dominions, or rulers, or authorities. Those are not just earthly thrones, dominions, rulers, or authority. Those are that's language used to describe these spiritual ideas. All things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body. It's the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he may be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things, that's us included, reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, by the blood of his cross. You see, this whole passage in Colossians 1 is about this battle that's going on, about driving out the ruler of the world, about binding the strong man, about making a mockery of the powers that they saw behind the scenes here. And Paul says, and he did it on the cross. Well, I thought the cross was just about, you know, a, a legal payment, a financial payment to give his life as a ransom for many. No, it's not just that. That's part of it. But he does that by disarming powers at play. Look what happens in Colossians 2, beginning at verse 14. Um, let's back up to 13. Colossians 2, 13. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set that aside, nailing it to the cross. And then verse 15, this is pretty interesting. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That's battle language. That's Paul saying, you know what Jesus did? He threw the strong man out. He threw out the ruler of the world. He disarmed Satan. He kicked him out. 
what Jesus did on the cross. He overthrew all these, these forces behind the scene that are making a mockery of God's creation. That's what he did on the cross. He liberated us. He redeemed us. He gave his life as a ransom payment for us on the cross because he conquered Satan and his works and his powers and the fear that he holds over people. He conquered all of that on the cross. So the cross is God's victory over all these battles. The cross is where the victory is won, which brings an interesting question. So what? The cross is where the victory is won. I get it. You walked in here this morning. You didn't have to hear this sermon to know that the cross, the crucifixion, was a pretty important idea in Christianity. I get it. That's nothing new. So what does it matter? You came in here knowing about the crucifixion. You didn't think about other crucifixions. You thought about the crucifixion of Jesus, where he gave his life as a ransom for us, where he shed his blood to forgive us for our sins. All that's personal. Surely it's more than a legal battle. Surely it's more than a financial transaction. So what? The battle's been won. So yeah, you're set free from sin. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're set free from trying to work your way into God's grace. The battle's already been won. You're set free from the devil's grasp and the devil's reign in your life, sure. The battle's been won. Evil has been overcome. But wouldn't you say there's still evil in the world today? Wouldn't you say that there are still problems in the world today? And I don't want you to come away from this message saying, okay, well, the Son of God, Jesus, died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. That's a great verse. But there's still evil today. There's still pain and suffering today. So why is that? So what? The battle's won. It was on the cross. He disarmed the powers. He overthrew the powers. He made a mockery of the powers. He bound the strong man. He kicked him out. Jesus wins. But we still fight. I know you're not supposed to, but have you ever cut the head off of a snake? Probably you don't want to admit that, I'm sure. Okay, but maybe you have. You've seen a snake, snakes, and I think I'm okay saying that um, maybe, maybe we kill snakes when we see snakes. I'll just say that. But you've done that. And the snake still moves, right? I've never, yeah, okay. So you kill the snake, and the snake still moves around. I remember we did it in our yard. Somebody did it in our yard. I don't take responsibility for that. But somebody hung it up on a branch in our yard, and it was still moving around. I was watching uh, Man vs. Wild years ago, Bear Grylls. You know, you've seen Bear Grylls. And he would kill like a, a poisonous snake, and he would cut the head off. And you know what he did with the head? Anybody know? You don't just leave it because you can still step on it, and the fangs, I understand, can still go in your foot or something and still shoot some venom inside you. I think that's true. And so Bear Grylls outdoorsman said you gotta dig a hole and bury the head of the snake why it's dead right but it still has a little fight left in it it's dead but it's still a little bit dangerous to you you ever know a story of someone or something or some country some war where there was a decisive blow like cutting the head off of a snake decisive blow you know what's over that snake is not gonna live it's not gonna be around anymore he's gone but it's still a little bit dangerous. I think about in World War II, bombs are dropped. Decisive blow. But still the battle would rage on for a while. I think about other times when a decisive blow has been given. But it still has to play out until the very end. And if I understand scripture right, that's, that's what's happening here. On the cross, a couple thousand years ago, Jesus goes to give his life as a ransom for many. The price is paid. Satan is thrown out. The powers are overcome. The battle is won. But still, we must fight. Many of you in this room, you watch football. You watch sports. And you know that, you know, it's uh, Major League Baseball playoffs right now. If a team goes up 10 to nothing in the fifth inning, it's a pretty good indication that that team's going to win the game, right? Unless all the players just quit playing. 
Your football team goes up 38 to 7 in the first half or something like that. I don't know. That's a pretty good indication they're going to win the game unless they don't come out after halftime. The decisive blows have been given. The battle must continue until the game's over. That's where we are. Understand it a little bit more. The, the head of the snake, the serpent, has been cut off. But it can still be dangerous. It can still bring about pain, evil, and suffering. The battle's decisive blows have been, you know, given out. But we must continue to fight. The battle is won. But we still must fight. A lot that plays into this. I know that on the cross, Jesus accomplishes the will of God, secures the victory for us, but I know that every day of our lives, you and I still fight the battles. Even after the cross, after the resurrection of the dead, after the resurrection of Jesus, Paul writes all these letters, the early New Testament writers write all these letters about how we've got to continue to fight the battles. Nobody said it's going to be easy. Nobody said that, that it's never going to be a, a tough struggle or anything like that. What they say is that the battle still goes on and we'll either join the fight, seeking the good of our neighbors, doing good to people around us, striving for the will of God, or we'll sit on the sidelines. In Paul's words, we will either, either overcome the evil still present in the world with good or we'll contribute to the evil by allowing in Jesus' words, we will either deny ourselves, take up our cross, the power to overthrow Satan, take up our cross and follow him, or we won't. The choice is ours. The battle's been won. On the cross, you were liberated from your sins. The devil was destroyed. The work of Satan was thrown out. Strong man. Jesus wins. But today, we still must fight. Maybe for you, there's a lot of spiritual warfare language in the Bible. Maybe for you today, that means you take up your armor. Maybe for you, that means you decide, okay, I have faith in this one who's gone to the cross to die for my sins, to throw out the work of Satan. I, I, I have faith in him. I trust in him. Maybe today that means you turn away from a, if your life has been a selfish life, doing what you want to do, seeking out your desires. Maybe today's a day when we decide we're not going to do that anymore. See what Jesus has done for us, what God has secured for us. And I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live for that kind of person. So I turn from my old way of living and I turn to a new way of life. In Paul's language, maybe it's that you're buried with Christ in baptism. You rise up to live chapter 6. Maybe that's where our story is today. Maybe you're someone who's been a Christian. Maybe you're someone who's already given your life to God, but there's still struggles. There are still struggles. There will be struggles in life. Maybe those have gotten you down. So maybe today is the day that you decide again, no, I'm going to follow Jesus with all that I am and all that I have. Maybe things have burdened you. Maybe the, the snake is still rearing his head. Maybe even though you know the decisive blows have been given, you still feel like you're losing the battle. So maybe it's a day when we try, maybe today is a day when we try to get our lives straightened out, back on the right track. Maybe there's some things happening in your life where uh, you want your brothers and sisters in Christ here in this room to pray for you about whatever's happening in your life or in your world. The crucifixion can be very puzzling. And I don't know that I have all the answers. In fact, I know that I don't have all the answers. But I know that it's more than just a financial, financial transaction where my sins are paid for because I just can't do right. It is that, but it's a lot more. It's Jesus overcoming Satan on the cross by his resurrection, inviting us into this story, this journey with him, where we know the battle's won, but we continue to fight every day. And this morning... If there's anything you want to do, any response that you want to make to put up a fight, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.